This is it. The home stretch. We are nearly there. Keep going. And as always, the Lib Dem podcast and the Nevermind the Bar Charts podcast is with you every step of the way. We are here on our last episode before polling day. Don't worry, we'll have lots more afterwards. And I'm joined by David McKenzie and party president Mark Pack. And we're going to go through exactly what we think of the campaigns, how it's gone, what surprises we might look for uh, on polling day. How do you make sense of these polls with such different seat numbers for the Tories and us? But we, I want to start the episode by just saying a couple of thank yous. Mm. And I'm sure the rest of the panel will join me in this in a second. That You know, whatever we think of these last five years... It has been an extraordinary parliament with COVID, Brexit, a Ukraine war, cost of living, scandals, by-elections, three different prime ministers. And I have to say, on, on behalf of someone up here in the north, that our MPs, their staff, their volunteers, Party HQ, have managed all of that craziness and put us in a position where we have the opportunity to gain seats across the country and it's a very exciting time and from the Lib Dem podcast I want to say just a thank you to all those people that work unspeakable hours and do so much for our party and get usually so little recognition and I assume Mark as party president mm. you, you would like to echo those sentiments. Absolutely and and maybe also particularly a thank you to those people who are council by election candidates and agents on Thursday because you know, in some cases, they're just making sure there's a Lib Dem name on the ballot paper, and that's a, an important contribution. But in other cases, there are contests that we have a real chance of winning. That's always a tough slog anyway, but to be doing that while all of this other stuff is so overshadowing and diverting attention and resources, a particular thanks. Um, and maybe also, I know we've paid tribute to Andrew Stunnell previously, who sadly died earlier this year, but Andrew's wisdom in how to understand canvas data and you know, helping create the sort of formulas we use in the party means that you know, if we do get it right in the next few days, it will be a very fitting tribute to his very wise counsel and support for so many of us over such a long period of time. Yeah, absolutely. David, what about yourself? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it always comes down to the people on the ground who probably don't get the level of recognition mm. sometimes they ultimately deserve. You know, as somebody who has uh, has been involved in many a campaign, both pounding the streets and, you know, from a, from a management perspective, uh, I think it's always, you know, an astute thing to do to mention the fact that we the party really wouldn't be where it is without its you know avid volunteers Absolutely. and people who just get out and support the party so thank you to everybody who's done what they've done up to this mm -hmm. point but also thank you to everybody who's going to be coming out in this important week up until thursday and i encourage you nothing is ever certain if you have the opportunity to get out this week obviously myself the rest of the panel the party would much appreciate that and every effort up until polling day is really going to make a major difference so thank you to everybody that's able to do it mm -hmm. And it was it was quite amusing. I don't know if uh, either of you saw this. There was a, I think there was a Tory activist who was complaining about the level of Lib Dem leaflets that were arriving. I think it might have been in Tunbridge or somewhere like that. Yeah, it, yes, it was very funny that. How can the Lib Dems afford to do so many leaflets? And every, there were just streams of places. We use volunteers. Yeah. We use volunteers. Thank you to our amazing volunteers. We're also better at cost effective procurement than the Conservatives as well. Absolutely. So we're in the home stretch, Mark. You've been out and about, no doubt, doing yeah. your uh, your work as not just an activist, but as party president. How is it feeling for you on the doors? It's a really strange election, I think, for two reasons. One is, and let's hope I'm not jinxing it in saying this, it's a general election that's gone well for us. You know, that's not our usual experience of general election campaigns. And so that, I think, leaves everyone who's been around a bit a little bit unnerved as to when's it start going to return to, you know... <laughs> what we used, sadly used to. But the other is that, you know, obviously there are places where we're fighting the nationalists, places where we're fighting Labour, but the bulk of our serious contests are up against the Conservatives. And the Conservative campaign just doesn't really seem to have turned up. It's, you know, it's just every week you sort of think, well, surely this is the week when the waves of direct mail will start landing, when all of the attacks on our candidates will hit the press and so on. And it just, um, it's epitomised, I guess, by the day before the manifesto launch, when, you know, what, what every party does the day before another party launches a manifesto is sends out a whole load of criticisms and attack lines to the media. 
And I, rem- I was sort of sat at the other end of the office from our press team. And, you know, when they were sort of, you know, the Tory dossier sort of landed, I think the most common sound I heard from them was laughter, just yeah. at how poorly researched it was. And they were accusing us of sort of doing things that then the government had done anyway. And you sort of think, have you not updated this document for years? It just, so it seems to be, fingers crossed, going really well, but g- genuinely huge numbers of undecided voters. And, you know, I've always been a bit sceptical in the past when people say, oh, there are loads of undecided. And, you know, I've sometimes quietly thought, yeah, maybe you're not quite canvassing them as well as you should or whatever. But this time, I believe as well, (laughs) it is genuinely. And so in that sense, you know, this isn't just for form's sake. It does feel like there's a big difference in range of results that will be determined by what happens in the last few days. It's not, you know, it's not a done deal. The election isn't over. Lots of people still who are going to vote still have to make up their minds. David? Yeah, look, um, I, you know, hands up. I've not been able to do as much this election as I would have liked to. I've got other things going on in, uh, in my personal and business life. But um, what I would say from the opportunities that I've had to get out on the doorstep, um, I was out mm. last week uh, actually in Hinkley and Bosworth with the great candidate Michael Mullaney. Um, and what I was very, very surprised about is it seems to be a complete sort of 360 from the 2019 scenario where people who I would have generally considered that may have been quite hostile to ourselves, that really doesn't seem to be what I'm getting on the doorstep, at least in the conversations that I'm having. And as Mark rightly says, I think there's a lot of people out there who are genuinely undecided about how they're going to give their vote come Thursday. That does mean, obviously, there's a lot of opportunity to claim a large part of that undecided vote prior to Thursday, which is, you know, to echo my previous sentiments, there's a lot to be done and still to be done, you know, come Thursday. But what I I'm very, very surprised about is people are, they're looking for an alternative. Mm. Um, And there's a lot of people who I think genuinely in 2019, when I canvassed in the same area, were very, very set on voting for Conservative, that now this time just do not know where to put their vote. Um, And they are actually pretty much looking at considering us as a viable option to do that. So, you know, can and we all know what happened in 2019 and the reason why there was maybe a bit of backlash towards ourselves. That just seems to have gone away entirely. Can I do a bit of geometry pedantry, please? If yes. it's 360 degrees, we'd be ended up back where we were. Which... Sorry, 180. 180. 180. <laughs> yes, I meant to say 180. <laughs> Uh, uh, David was thinking, as soon as I said that, a new mark was going to pick me up on it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I mean, I've been at, first, I think there's the, the consistency, and we're going to talk about polls in a second, is that the Tory vote has, has dropped significantly. I've been in areas where we have long-standing canvas data. So when I canvass, I always look at the history to see where they've got. And some of the people I've been canvassing have been absolutely solid, no-moving blue voters and they're not this time. Uh, now, obviously, there's you have to take into account potential shy Toryism and things like that, but it just feels different this time. And it and what I will say is there's a lot of flux. You know, people are trying to figure out which way to go. And I know the Tories use this line a lot about Keir Starmer isn't particularly loved, and I I actually believe that he's he's he is. I think and Mark again will correct me. He's the least popular opposition leader to go into government if mm. polls are to believed in mm. Labour. So it's there's a very curious mix going on. And mixing all of that when you've got local factors as well, whether it, whether it might be the Greens or or it might be a an anti kind of Keir Starmer because of the Gaza issue, particularly up here in the northwest. There's all sorts of stuff going on, which means actually genuinely in some seats, we might come second, we might come fourth, we are, and we don't know how that's going to go. But I suppose, Mark, from again, just reiterating that point, is that with so much in flux, a that could explain to why the the poll numbers are showing such such big gaps in what the Tory what the Tory seat number could be, because some of them have as low as getting into their twenties and thirties, others up to around 180 mm. roughly um i think anything oh anything over 150 i think the tories would take right now yeah i mean it's really weird that i think if the exit poll comes out and it has let's say tories on 150 seats i think the mood in say cchq would be one of relief yeah. and you know let's not 150 seats would be a catastrophically awful result for them but i think instinctively and our instinctive reactions as well would probably be oh They've dodged a bit of a bullet there. So, I mean, I guess they're 
I don't know how you extend the analogy there, Bobby is so bullet ridden that may, you know, dodging an extra one, you shouldn't forget about all the other bullets. But I, I think one of, there, there are two issues really with the polls. One is this large number of people who voted Tory in 2019 and are currently undecided and how you treat them in the polls, therefore, makes quite a big difference to the headline figures. The other is what is the distribution of the decline in Tory support? And to put it very simply, it is normally when a party falls heavily in support, it's pretty uniform across the country. But just occasionally, there are catastrophic landslide defeats in which it's very concentrated in the areas that cost you the most seats. And so we just won't know. I mean, certainly until the exit poll and maybe not until the first few results have come in as to whether we're in the normal pattern or this is one of the really special exceptions. So I I don't think I I will feel quite as tense in that moment. Before. I don't think I felt quite as tense as I will do on Thursday in that moment before the exit poll for a long, long time, because actually, even when the exit poll say surprised us in 20, you know, in 2015, we sort of knew we were on to a drubbing. You know, I, I just think there is a real uncertainty about the future of British politics, which, you know, how do we do? How does reform do? How do the Tories do? Even though, obviously, if any of us had to bet, we would not A, not bet because of, you know, the current environment, but B, we'd <laughs> obviously pick for Keir Starmer as being, you know, the Labour Prime Minister, you know, the Prime Minister uh, by the end of the week. And it is strange, and this comes back to, I think, what we were all saying earlier, that you know, Labour win very, very few general elections in this country. You know, they only win one in three elections, you know, since since the Second World War. And yet it seems that that bit is a pretty straightforward, you know, not the not the exceptional bit about this election. It's it's all very, very strange, but exciting because part of what happens, our fate is in our hands. But I, I want to question this about because obviously there's been lots of MRP polls, which are these more sophisticated mm -hmm. polls. I remember John Curtis saying, actually, when you get into the constituency level candidate, kind of they become less reliable. Uh, and, you know, we've seen random ones mm. where we've seen, well, that's clearly Labour is never going to win there. Or even secretly we say, well, we know the Lib Dems aren't going to win there. Um, but actually, so how much faith should we have in the exit poll? Because this is this is an extraordinary mm. election. It's not, yeah. we do know that, well, we, we think we know that the Tories and Labour are going to have their worst share of the vote mm. since probably the war, we reckon. Mm. Um, so how much faith can we have in the exit poll is going to be accurate? I think quite a high level of faith. Obviously, I reserve the judgment, you know, the right to completely change my view at 10.01 p.m. on Thursday evening. So I think because what the exit poll does is it's based on the interview about 17,000 people at the polling stations on Thursday. And so questions about how are people going to make up their minds? Are they going to vote, not vote? <clears throat> All of those aren't a problem for the exit poll because they're sampling people who have just voted, asking them what they have just done. So that makes the exit poll a very scary thing because your reputation is really on the line, but also actually easier than normal polling because you've got those two big uncertainties removed. I also think the sort of contests that the exit poll has to understand, like how are we doing against the Tories in areas where we're really piling in our strength? How is Labour doing against reform, actually, in sort of areas that voted heavily leave? Those are all the sorts of challenges that previous exit polls in the last few elections have had to deal with. So I think if I was on the exit poll team, I'd obviously be nervous because, you know, you get it wrong and people will remember that for 50 years. Uh, you know, I still immediately think, oh, yeah, that 1992 exit, po sorry, that 1987 exit poll, but, you know, made it look like it might be a hung parliament and it was actually a very comfortable Tory win. So, but it does, it's hard to see why the exit poll would be wrong this time. David, I suppose from uh, with your Scottish hat on as well, in terms of before the elect, before the complete collapse in the Tory kind of machine happened, a lot of people think, well, Scotland might decide this election. How big Keir Starmer's majority be will be actually based on what's happening in Scotland. Now, it's kind of flown under the radar a little bit, I would say, the Scottish election, the Scottish um, contests. But what is your impression from the from people you speak to up there? So I was actually, I was in Edinburgh on Saturday uh, and got an opportunity to speak to some uh, to some colleagues up north. Um, obviously, I, I no longer live in Scotland, uh, but obviously my family still do. Uh, and um, and also, as you well know, obviously, I get a good insight into the Labour side of things as well in Scotland as a result. Um, so, look, it's it's really the, the, you know, 
and kind of a, a Mark Pack answer, I reserve my right to change my view. But I think <laughs> big things are going to big things are going to be changing up there uh, come Thursday. So, look, you've had the disaster of the Hamza Yusuf uh, being first minister, um, and obviously dramatic reduction in polls for the SNP as a result. They've brought in John Swinney as the kind of steady hand to try and get things back to a level of normalcy for the SNP. But the reality is, is uh, John is not the charismatic figure that a Nicola Sturgeon or an Alex Salmond previously were. And I don't think he carries the same level of confidence from the electorate that previously those leaders did. Um, I think what we'll end up seeing is we'll actually see quite a, a return uh, for the Labour Party in the central belt in Scotland. Um, and all sort of protections are, are showing that. So we could see a kind of return to that old red Clyde side, um, uh, you know, what was previously done post-war and was always kind of a very solid Labour vote to Parliament. Um, I think there may be actually some interesting results for the Lib Dems in Scotland as well. Um, there's obviously, there's actually, a, weirdly enough, there was a report uh, from BBC News at 10 that was done in my hometown of Greenock just a couple of weeks ago where they were sort of going all over Scotland um, and people talking about the, the heritage of the Liberal Party and the Crofton community in the Highlands and people sort of saying, you know, you know that the party really used to stand up for our rights. So there seems to be a, a recognition that perhaps the SNP has really let down people in a lot of rural communities where we used to do very, very well. So it'll be interesting to see how things change come Thursday. I think that also the other thing you need to keep in mind is the large amount of SNP MPs that are walking away from the post at this election. So there are some seats where maybe they had built up a level of personal vote that has completely gone out the window. So um, it'll be a seat by seat basis, but you know maybe we could see in Blackford's seat, which used to be Charles Kennedy, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what the result might be there. Um, and I'm also interested to see how things pan out in the central belt. But I do think that it's not as big as a factor as it previously was considered. And I think if Labour can get somewhere between sort of 20 to 25 seats, you know, they're on course to a very, very dramatic victory. And actually, it takes anything away from John Swinney that he has from a negotiating perspective. And, you know, he's sort of coming out now and saying, oh, we could potentially work with Labour. But, you know, we all know that the one thing that they want for that is another independence referendum. And I just do not see Labour going down that route at all. Apart from uh, that, that, no, it's really interesting that about the Scottish perspective. And like I said, that's just another dynamic we're going to have to deal mm. with, Mark. But I mean, in terms of the campaigns, like I say, we're in the, the final phase. Let's deal with the Tories first, OK? Because... I mean, we all said uh, that, you know, at some point the polls will narrow. Mm. At some point they're going to get, and they haven't. You know, Labour have basically... I think, both I think Labour... Rishi's still telling himself that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, both Labour and the Tories have dropped. Obviously, the Tories mm. have dropped more. Um, but actually, that they've never got within... Well, there's a couple of polls slightly different, but still, on average, it's, what, 20 points difference? Yeah. But the, the Tory campaign has just been it's befuddled. Just, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, even the, even the betting scandal last week, even yeah. though it didn't adversely hit them in the polls, I wonder if they've actually flawed out in terms of no matter what happens now, the Tory vote isn't going to go below that mark. Yeah. I mean, I re still very vividly remember watching Rishi Sunak standing there in the rain and mostly thinking, this is just bizarre. Why did he not get an umbrella? But a little bit of me remembering that in 2019, Boris Johnson did things like hiding in the fridge that I thought were absurd, and yet he did go on to win the election. So it was a bit of me thinking, well, maybe maybe this is a really smart campaign, and actually it's a deliberate look. And it's all, and they, But then you sort of think, well, then I go to a target seat, and there's no immediate direct mail that the Tories have put in the post the day that Sunak called the election. And in fact, the Tory candidate there was on holiday. And you sort of think this is OK. They've caught themselves a bit by surprise, but surely their campaign will turn up. And yet it's 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 not just that they've had a whole load of unforced blunders like D-Day, uh, but also the they just their organisation seems to have really fallen apart now. You know, again, uh, I will quote the David sort of defence of reserving the right to change my mind, at, you know, just after 10 p.m. on Thursday. And maybe they will pull off some surprise wins and it will turn out there's an underappreciated level of very targeted campaigning they've been doing. But it's it's really hard to spot in the places that we've been, you know, campaigning in in really heavily. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's 
and you know in a way the real sign of the problems of the Tory campaign is that there's already been the press briefings about how Isaac Levido, who's meant to be running their campaign, didn't want the election to happen. You know, when you've got press stories about how your campaign chief didn't want the election to happen, that's not a happy ship. And that's people not even waiting to polling day before they try to get their alibis out. Um, so let's hope all of those portents this time do do turn out to be true. And, and I just think of in, in my patch where I'm, where I'm standing in Ribble Valley, which is against a very long standing conservative in Nigel Evans for 32 years he's done it the lack of signs mm. the lack of activity the lack of it, it's it's astonishing really. the quality of the leaflets it's it's all looked and you know with the old talk about i remember us talking about a 50 million pound war chest the tories mm. had where have they spent that money you and know, they increased the expense limit especially so they could make use of them yeah, I don't, I just, I don't understand. I was, and I get the gaffes and stuff like that, which you know, you know, are amusing to us political wonks. Other than, other than D Day, which really landed badly, most people won't have really noticed them. But it's just, it's just an insipid campaign. Well, actually, really? that's but, not. But I, that's... But I... So Sorry, I was, was going to say, but I even think, John, even the the standing in the rain at home with people going like, "What is this?" You know, mm. I, I think people were sort of thinking, "Oh, how could you do that so badly?" I, I don't think it's even just some things that have only hit with certain people who are interested in politics. I think across the board, people are really looking at this and going, you know, "Anything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong," um, or or even not has gone wrong. They've just done it very, very badly. Mark, yeah, I was just going to say, I sort of disagree with you slightly, I guess, in terms of what the public's noticed, because Maureen Common did a fantastic bit of polling asking people if they had noticed particular incidents and also whether they made people think less well of the party as a result. A D-Day is right up in the top right of nearly everyone aware of it, nearly everyone thinking worse of the Tories for it. But actually the gambling scandal is nearly as high as that. But interestingly, the third sort of worst in that sense for any party, and yet again, it's a Tory one, was the Sky TV debacle where Rishi Sunak talked about, you know, his... Missing not having Sky time. TV when he was growing up. <laughs> and, and and in a way, I think that's almost more telling because in one sense, it's pretty trivial, you know, and it was a one, you know, a clumsily worded sentence in one interview and all of that. But I think the reason that and the gambling stories in particular have seemed to have hit the Tories so much is they symbolise the wider complaint about the Tory party. A little bit like, actually, you know, when people attack the Lib Dems, quite often they still mention tuition fees because it sort of symbolises a whole set of other things that people you know, didn't like, mistakes that we made in the past. Um, and, you know, when when people are in that sense picking on the trivial thing to symbolise the big problem, that's when you're in real trouble. Um, amusingly, one of the other most noticed things, although perhaps, you know, in a degree of uh, sense of fair play, people don't really hold against Sunak, but it is, uh, is the chickens running away. Uh, well, no, the sheep, sheep. sorry it was sheep, sheep. running away yeah, yeah. Uh, that that got that got you know about a quarter of the population say they've noticed that which you know for a a silly trivial little bit of tv footage as it were is yeah. unfortunate even, even mark just to kind of say you know in mm. terms of i've had the opportunity to see some stuff that local candidates are putting out from mm. the conservatives mm. and things that i would have thought in the past that you know, certainly uh, their campaign managers, but even from, uh, you know, from GCHQ, uh, sorry, from CCHQ, I was going to say GCHQ there, that would have been wrong, um, from CCHQ, <laughs> um, from CCHQ would have immediately said, do not put that out there. You know, that, that just doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, I, I saw a video that a candidate put out locally where they were sat with a person who is literally the super car dealer to the rich and famous talking about, you know, you, you know, you can't vote for these people because they're going to give your money to X, Y, Z. And I just thought during a cost of living crisis, for you to be sat in front of McLarens and mm. you know Ferraris and talking about you have to vote for, for Conservatives because we've got your best interests in heart. Uh, any campaign manager worth their salt, you know, and I've done this before, mm. would have been going, there's absolutely no way you can put that out with what that looks like. You know, that, that, yeah. you know, that just doesn't seem to be happening. Yeah. Lost, you know who actually... Yeah. But you know who emerges with a bit of credit, actually, in all of that is Ian Dale. You know, so he thought about standing as the Tory candidate in Tunbridge Wells. And then the story came out about some impolitic things he'd said about Tunbridge Wells in the past. And he immediately thought, right, OK, I can't do this. I'm going to pull out. Um, and I think that's to his credit that he saw that, but contrast sharply with, for example, the Conservative candidate in Harpenden and Berkhamsted, who used to, uh, you know, do lobbying for Vladimir Putin. 
And you sort of think, you know, not surprisingly, the Lib Dem literature makes quite a lot of hay of that. And you just sort of think, what a sloppy campaign that the Tories have ended up putting up somebody with such a huge vulnerability like that as a candidate in, you know, one of the key Lib Dem Tory battlegrounds in the whole country. You know, Harpen and Berkhamsted is a seat that is you know, really up there near the top of the seats we're trying to win. Victoria, our candidate there, was one of the few candidates we showcased at our spring conference rally and so on. And, you know, their candidate there really should have had the wisdom of Ian Dale. It's, it's, it's almost, uh, Mark, to, to quote myself earlier, rightly this time, it's almost a 180 <laughs> from the last election. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. because you know, it was previously the Labour Party that <clears> had a bunch of candidates <throat> that were up that had, you know, things within their history that were <clears> really, un, you know, unsavoury. And now it's gone completely <clears> to <throat> the other side where you're putting up candidates who are either saying things or have done things or have been involved in things that the general public just cannot get behind. Yeah. And, uh, and, and speaking of dodgy candidates, that segues lovely into the reform. To you, John, a candidate. No, oh, 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 thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. President. Thank you. Outrageous. Honestly, I hear all these things, and that's the kind of gratitude I get. Um, but no, I mean, it, what's interesting is the reform campaign so far. So honestly, they had a big bump when, when Farage came out. Now, have the wheels come off that slightly? Have they hit the kind of... I mean, the Putin comments, um, obviously the lots of... Uh, um, but I will say lots of candidates with very interesting and not mm. particularly very nice views about on minorities. Um, and but I do wonder whether it's just this was just their natural ceiling again that they weren't going to get much beyond sixteen percent of the vote. But and are they building themselves up for some for the next election, which is what we talk about? You know, you need to campaign with the next election in mind as well. But David, I'll come to you first. Mm. I mean, reform have got probably the attention they want. Uh, but I assume I, I think they're only going to get two seats maximum. I wouldn't expect them to get any more. But what's your kind of view on what reform have done? Um, it's uh, I mean, you know, I'm uh, I think it's obviously been in their benefit that they managed to get Nigel Farage back to a frontline position. You know, as much as I dislike the man, you know, it cannot be. Uh, uh, you know, you, you have to obviously view the fact that he's a better leader than what they had. So he's been able to get them a slight bump in the polls. Whether they'll be able to carry that into actual seats, you know, I think maybe Nigel might take his seat in Clacton. Um, and then we may maybe see one or two others. I don't know if we'll see this dramatic, you know, pull through that they're seeing. If there is, by the way, and the Tories have a terrible result, there is a real post-election problem that they conservatives have because there will be elements within their party that will be calling for certain things about bringing certain people in house that will be problematic right but I, I don't know if we'll generally see that breakthrough um i think what's more kind of worrying is the fact that they seem to be utilizing this election where you say they have a natural ceiling as making significant attacks on democracy and you know the questioning of our politicians and our political parties saying that you know we've been set up this is actors that are saying things about us or you know the bbc question time audience was significantly stacked against me these are all things completely out of the trump playbook and it's damaging to democracy it's damaging to our political structure it's damaging to our, our you know our media uh, companies who are, are rightly supposed to hold people to account i just kind of worry where that goes if, if nigel does end up winning a seat and kind of what his plans are for the next five years in parliament mark yeah, I mean, I guess picking up on that last point, fundamentally, I'm a Democrat. And I think, therefore, if there is a viewpoint held by, you know, in, and wins the support of, say, several million people at the ballot box, it should be properly represented in the House of Commons. And that's often us wishing that we had more seats. But for all that I, you know, hugely disagree with, you know, the political views and indeed the core moral values of, you know, Nigel Farage and many of his supporters. In the end, I do think it's better for democracy if that plays out within the democratic system rather than outside of it. So with somewhat gritted teeth, I think we should be grateful at least that he is trying to secure political power through the democratic process rather than you know outside of it. Um, I think, I mean, the audience thing is an interesting one because obviously Joe, you know, our leader really suffered from that in the 2019 question time where the audience was very hostile to her right from from the get-go and I think that partly reflects actually a problem for all smaller parties which is those audiences tend to be picked to be representative of the population as a whole 
and therefore there are not many fans, as it were, of your side if you are a smaller party in the audience. And so what we saw with Nigel Farage was there's a lot of people who really dislike him and his party. And any audience that's reasonably representative of the public is going to have a lot of those people in it. I think the question is whether his mistakes and his blunders and some of their awful candidate choices, I guess I guess that probably affects their ability to try to get over 20 percent, but probably doesn't affect the first, say, 10 percent of their support. You know, you sort of feel there's a core of support there who either are not put off by those things or are willing to believe the conspiracy theories about why, you know, it's. Uh, it's not really something to, you know, in their view, to hold against Farage or reform. But in terms of trying to break through to be a seriously broadly popular party, I also think it's a mistake, sort of strategically on Farage's part, because it probably emboldens those in the Conservative Party who want nothing to do with him. You know, one of the few things I think probably all three of us on this call would agree with Boris Johnson on was his approach to supporting Ukraine after Russia's you know, uh, uh, second invasion, I guess one should call it, after the first invasion a few years previously. Um, And, you know, hearing Farage sort of, you know, parroting essentially the pro-Putin lines is not strategically the smart move if you want to essentially do a reverse takeover of the Conservative Party. So uh, I think, you know, I think he's probably backing himself into a dead end. It's a dead end that may be dramatic and may bring some short-term success, but hopefully is a is a dead end that also very much puts a cap on how far he can go. No, that, that's really interesting. And, and we'll, we'll wait and see. But mm. I suppose we have to touch base on uh, on the the likely future government, and that is, uh, that mm. is the Labour Party and how their campaign has gone. Uh, now, yeah, for me, I kind of feel it. I'm 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 not the biggest football fan, but I'm going to use a football analogy here. It kind of feels like the four 0 up at half time, and then I just kind of coasting because they know they've already won it. I think some people refer to it as the the Ming vase kind of strategy of political campaign. You just don't do anything to break it. Um, but I do wonder: a are, are they missing an opportunity because they are going to win masses of seats at Labour. I mean, the fact that they potentially win more seats but get less votes than what they got in 2017 is just, well, it's another astonishing thing to do with our electoral system. But I can't I can't make my mind. I think they've done enough to win, but I wonder if they're sowing seeds of problems later on where Johnson was very good. He had a very wide but shallow support in 2019. And I wonder if that's where Labour are going to be, David. The fact that they are, mm-hmm. they're going to win plenty of seats and represent plenty of areas in the country but not they won't be absolutely loved and embedded in those areas and they could quickly lose them uh, going forward. I mean, that's the big change that's obviously happening, I think, in politics generally in the UK as post sort of 2019, we have seen this change uh, in how constituencies are willing to to vote. You know, in, in previous elections, there has been an element of, you know, we're Labour, we're Conservative. Generally, that's quite, you know, embedded in particular communities or particular um, people from certain backgrounds. Um, I, I think there's been a complete explosion of that. I know, obviously, that there's been talks for probably since before I was born about a realignment in British politics. I, I do think in some ways our British political system and electoral system is somewhat driving us towards what is going to happen in terms of long term. But it does seem like um, there is a real kind of, if you don't get something done and get it done quite quickly, then those seats that supported you will, you know, are willing to say, no, no, we gave you an opportunity and we're going to look elsewhere. You know, you look at um, 1997, where uh, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, etc., when they came into government, there was a view of like, okay, we've been given the chance to govern, we'll do some things, but we're not going to do huge dramatic things in the first term, especially on things like the NHS and other areas. Once they got to that 2001 election, um, you know, their tagline was a lot done, a lot more to do. And they were really saying, you know, give us a second term in office where we can really start to get the ball rolling on the things that changes we want to make. I think the difference is now is that the, the you know the general public are not going to give you that amount of time. They expect to see big changes almost immediately. Um, and if things don't start to turn or shift towards that, then I think Keir Starmer and the Labour Party will have problems on their hands in, in areas where they may have won support. Mm. Mark, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that really puzzles me about Starmer during this campaign is I feel I understand him less at the end of it than at the beginning of it and obviously I follow politics much more closely than the average person and all of that 
But I was really struck by the answer he gave, for example, on electoral reform. And I, you know, he's previously talked about being reasonably in favour of electoral reform, but obviously took, you know, as leader in the end, decided to take quite a hard line on ensuring that despite the wishes of Labour members of the conference, that he was going to you know, block that becoming straightforward you know, party policy, electoral reform, the House of Commons, of course, that is. And then there was an interview during the election where he was asked about electoral reform. And I get why politically he would want to sort of dodge the question and, you know, not sort of open up the question about, well, how well are you really doing and all of that. But he was so hard line in basically dismissing any criticism of first past the post. He sort of thought, think i just i'm not quite sure what you really believe that is it was so different in tone and content from what he said about our electoral system when he say ran for leader and although i don't often agree with owen jones actually i do think he has a bit of a point about the really sharp contrast between what starmer said when he ran for labor leader what he's saying now when running for prime minister and definitely changing your views and reaction to events is a very reasonable, responsible, desirable thing to do. So, you know, I think often these gotchas of all you said X 10 years ago, you know, are overstated and so on. But on, say, electoral reform, nothing really has changed that in that sense would justify that massive, and I won't put a number of degrees on it, that massive change, you know, from from what he was saying only a few years ago. And it makes you wonder quite what you know quite where is his heart really where is his gut really and hence quite what sort of prime minister is he going to be you know what what are his instincts going to be when some unexpected crisis hits as they always do for every prime minister yeah and i even had one of our one of our members we were discussing will keir starmer be the angela merkel of Mm. kind of british politics that kind of you you maybe underestimated mm. is the thing, but actually mm. extraordinarily pragmatic. But I I don't know. I I'm I was I was really disappointed in his response about first past the post. And like I said, it seemed to be in a completely different sphere from what he's done before. But as we talked about in a previous episode, he he did what was necessary to get the mm. Labour leadership. He's done what was necessary to probably win a majority, which nobody thought possible five years mm. ago. So we just have to see. And but that brings us on to the Lib Dems about. Where our role going forward, and I think most people listening to this podcast will recognise the Lib Dems have had a good campaign. We've said from the start, we've had good message discipline. We've had a very popular manifesto. Ed seems to be doing everything possible to get attention where certainly smaller parties really struggle. But our role going forward is going to be that anchor to progressive central maybe centre left kind of politics and it's going to be key mark going forward and that's why us having a good night even though and i think maybe just maybe slightly labor i would have certainly changed tack and this whole kind of in fact just today this don't wake up with sunak kind of thing but that's all about making sure they get their vote out because they are worried that it seems like a foregone conclusion and the worried labor people labor voters will go well i can have a flutter with the lib dems yeah yeah, I think, well, with the um, the parliamentary boundary changes, if they'd been in place at the 2019 election, we would have won eight seats on the current boundary. So nine seats on Thursday will be progress, will be a success, will be a step forward. Remember, um, I might concede that maybe 10 is really the yardstick for success because it's psychologically nice to get into double figures. But I do think whatever happens, you know, however far beyond that basic yardstick of 10 that we get, um There is an important thing to remember, which actually partly touches on the tuition fees thing about we have campaigned very clearly on three central issues around the NHS, cost of living and sewage. And it's really important that the public feel that having voted for Lib Dems to take action on that, that's what they hear and see the party concentrating on in the next parliament. That, you know, the the way to put to bed, as it were, to slay the ghost of tuition fees is to say, well, you voted for X. And now we're delivering on X. Obviously, not being the government, I think it's fair to say Ed won't be prime minister on Friday. Um, that's tougher than if you know we were in government. But that we absolutely, in that sense, have to stick to. This is what we promised we were going to concentrate on. This is therefore what we're now going to deliver. And I say that because there will understandably, particularly with the new government, be lots of talk about, well, should we go in this direction or that direction? Talk about this issue, talk about that issue. And again, events will definitely push some new things top of the agenda. But at heart, we absolutely need to make sure those three issues that dominated our campaign are the three issues that the public then feel we are delivering on. 
Yeah, absolutely. David, anything you think we Lib Dems need to be concentrating on over the next, uh, well, however long the next Parliament lasts? Well, I just wanted to make one quick point when you really touched on how the campaign's been going. And I think uh, tone-wise, uh, Ed and his team have, have smashed out of the park in terms of getting the public um, a little bit interested more in what we've got to say. And also just generally getting a little bit more of a feel as what Ed is like as a person, not just as a leader, but as a person who's involved in politics and the things that drive him. And and actually, there's a there's a duality there, Mark, is what you touched upon, is that the public really don't have a sense of what Keir Starmer mm. believes or is, is interested in, versus I think they have a really good understanding of the things that have drove Ed into politics mm. and the reason why mm. he wants to make significant changes. So, you know, first of all, congratulations to the team that have, that have worked on that. I do think they've maybe stole a little bit from Willie Rennie's past campaigns in terms <laughs> of the stunts and, uh, and, and getting a little bit of traction with the media. So uh, big up to Willie Rennie if he's watching in terms of leading the way on that. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, I, I think that will go far. And by the way, can I just make one quick point about that as well? I think sometimes from people like ourselves who are involved in politics, we tend to think that the general public want to see these very stony-faced, serious mm. politicians that are interested in really, you know, sort of this is what we're doing from a, you know, from a, a policy background, blah, 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 blah. Um, I actually think they want to know what you're like as people and the things that interest you. And are you a little bit fun? And can you can you be something outside of politics? So um, I think it's played really well for us, actually. In terms of the things to concentrate on, um, really what Mark said there about the three issues that we've really been campaigning on. Uh, I was out on Thursday night um, in a predominantly Labour-supporting area in the Midlands. And um, the one thing that seems to be cutting through quite, quite well is people kept on saying to me, you know, what they've been doing in our in our seas and rivers is an absolute mm. disgrace, and it's good to see you guys leading on that because you know, the, and actually there was people who previously and I know because I knocked their doors were quite supportive of leaving the EU who were quite upfront with saying that has been a disaster from an environmental capacity and what it's done, um, and and you know these companies need to be held to account, and we need somebody that's actually going to push Labour to hold them mm. to account. Um, so yeah. I think that's where we'll be the really good uh, the tent pole for for delivering that in the next parliament. But ultimately, as Mark says, you know, people will gauge us on what have you continued to try and drive and deliver in parliament. And um, if we hopefully, you know, fingers put together, get over that ten mark, uh, then we might be able to do a, a little bit more, a little bit more. But I'm I'm quite positive on perhaps where this term of parliament will take us towards setting us up for maybe future success in the pre in the forthcoming elections next time. Yeah, and I th I suppose I want to kind of nearly finish this podcast just on a on a on an optimistic but also cautionary note in terms of politics is is very in flux. Like we said, there will be people who listen to this podcast who will be disappointed with what mm. it, in their own particular seats. And so for me, I've always had the, the idea, you've got to believe you can win. You know, you don't pile these leaflets out. You don't knock on so many noise. You don't do those ridiculous hours without that trust that you are building towards something better. Mm. But you've also got to be be weary of the factors. You don't know where you're going to come. You know, whether that's if you, whether you're fighting for first or second place or whether you're thinking you're hoping you get above reform or whatever mm. your goals are, you need to be mentally prepared for whatever that result might be. Because politics is a is can be a cruel mistress at times, and you do need to just be psychologically and mentally, even though you're exhausted, prepared for what that result may be. But I I generally think the I, I'm an optimist. But I generally think the Lib Dems are going to have a good night. Um, I think we are a lot of us are absolutely exhausted. <laughs> so again, your your first reactions don't go to your phone and say and tweet something reprehensible. So just take a beat. Be proud of what you've achieved. Be proud of whether you're a paper candidate or a target candidate. It doesn't matter. Be proud for flying that flag for the Lib yeah. Dems. Thank you so much for doing that. And also be wary of people with bad takes. You know, so there'll be lots of places where Labour think they can win. And actually, they probably weren't going to ever win, but will blame the Lib Dems for stopping them winning. Yeah. And so just be wary of people with terrible takes and who and simplistic views on politics and just go out and enjoy the last few days 
And my final prediction, and I, I briefed the guys before we, were, we started recording today, that my final prediction of an unexpected thing from this election will be, I think the Lib Dem podcast will have more MPs than both the Greens and Reform by the end. I, I'm plumping for three or four Lib Dem podcast panellists to be elected um, uh, come uh, the 5th of July. What's your unexpected thing you think is going to happen in this election mark as a light-hearted way to finish this off so i have a slightly a similar yardstick to you which is i used to joke at the beginning of this uh this parliament and indeed in the last parliament that our ambition should be to have a parliamentary party that wins more seats at a general election than the size of the lib dem federal board now we've <laughs> reduced the size of the liberal Dem federal board from uh from 41 to 16 we just need to finish the job uh, we need to finish the job on Thursday. I think that's a good yardstick for a sane party. Love it, David. Finishes off your your surprise to look out for on uh, on the results day. Oh, I could I could go really really positive, and Mark could probably kill me for saying I'm too much. I'm reaching but... for the bucket of cold water now. <laughs> <to her. laughs> um, look, I'm I'm not saying it would necessarily be ourselves, but I'd like to see perhaps the third party in Parliament not be the SNP anymore. So we'll yeah, see who that, who that may be. That would be lovely. Um, and if I wanted to end on a fun note, if uh, if we're going to see any more stunts from Ed, I think we need to see a sort of James Bond-esque skydive with a Union Jack parachute into Parliament on the day of return. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is the thing that will console us all. If we have a, you know, a, a disastrous turn of events and a really disappointing result, at least we will have been saved. The Ed Davey victory stunt. So just file that away at the back of your mind for consolation as necessary in the early hours of Friday morning. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening over the course of this entire parliament, whether you are a Lib Dem mm. podcast listener, never mind the bar charts listener, Absolutely. both of us, whether you watch on YouTube, we really appreciate it. Go out there and finish that job. One last heave. You can rest at the weekend. But thank you so much for watching, listening, for subscribing and everything you do. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Get over the line and we'll see you on the other side. Bye for now.